so I'll try to speak a bit fast, I guess, <laughs> and in English. Uh, so welcome to this first walk of the day. And the title of this walk is Fire Under My Ass, which is an English idiom to describe anything that makes my ass feel so metaphorically hot that I must get up and act. For some, it could perhaps also refer more literally to the hot biblical hell below our asses, which we don't feel so much right now. This biblical hot hell seems in fact to have gained new relevance in our contemporary imaginaries. And the climate crisis might be firing up under burned out biblical concepts like apocalypse, sin, guilt, and the fires of hell again. The way in which such fiery biblical terms seems to have become common metaphors when we are talking about the current climate crisis made me think that my contribution to this power walk about fire and the clean area should probably also be taking you to hell and back. So today I'll do just that. Take you to hell and back by trying to read this area through flammable biblical concepts and see where that reading will take us. As we walk, we will also righteously and biblically be looking for dirt on all that might look suspiciously clean at first sight. We are all dirty sinners, and we expect others to be dirty sinners too. When we find such dirt, we will collect it and rub it in on this white banner. Maybe you'll help me unfold it. We'll put it on the ground here, like this. Will someone come and stand on the sides of the banner? <laughs> take your place. Yes, thank you. Uh, at the end of the walk, when we dry off this banner with a wet cloth, we will hopefully uncover and reveal another group of fired up sinners on another guided tour to hell back in the year 1494. So now I actually invite you all to come and stand on this banner at least those of you who can fit in, and then you can take turns. <clears throat> well, you can't fit. You all get to stand on it. So while you stand here, I will talk a bit about money, sin, and our dirty souls that are going to burn in hell here in front of the bank. Because here in front of this common house of money, there are probably plenty of sins to talk about, as nothing seems to inspire sinners as money do. Anyone who wants to live in this area might also have to start here and check their accounts, as it doesn't come cheap to quit your climate sins and live quite climate positively. In this way, money might also redeem us from sin by being a mean to pay our way out of our climate sinful lives. It isn't the first time that redemption has been made a commodity to be bought and sold. And in the 13th and 14th century, for instance, there was a significant trade in so-called letters of indulgence. These letters were tokens of redemptions with which those who did not manage to do right by God could purchase to ease their way through the burns of purgatory. Purgatory was a sort of cleansing through fire that medieval Christian sinners would have to go through on their way to heaven. If you had money, you could, however, buy a sort of preemptive cleansing of your soul by bear, buying a share in a good deed of someone else. Um, you could, for instance, buy a stake in a crusade or the erection of a church. The St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is largely built by such compensations of sinners. This medieval banking of the soul is often compared to con the contemporary practice of trading in carbon credits to compensate for our climate sins. Like the letters of indulgence, the trade in carbon credits is also a trade where you can buy a redeeming share in the good deeds of others. Carbon credits is a sort of credit in CO2 reductions where you can buy a share in the reductions of others. A share that will absolve you from the sin of not reducing your own emissions. So through companies like, for instance, myclimate.org, 
I can thus buy a compensation for, say, a flight travel from Copenhagen to Stockholm. The price calculated for a ticket on economy class is 7 euros. I can then choose which project I would like to buy my share in, and I can, for instance, compensate through reforestation in Nicaragua or through climate-friendly cooking stoves for women in Kenya. In this way, I can hope that I might appease the fiery wrath, wrath of the climate, which might be our contemporary equivalent to a punishing god. Now, I did actually take the train here and not the plane, but either way, no travel is completely clean. In fact, we might all have gotten a little bit dirty on, <laughs> by traveling here. I hope, therefore, that you'll all get to dry off your traveling dust on this white banner. If not, please rub it off now before we go on and go a bit deeper into our righteous path. Okay, so please help me to carry the banner further down. If we take it on the other side, so we get the dust on this side. So please drag it along and I'll lead the way. Yes. <laughs> what happens if we try to follow the historic logic of comparing the system of carbon credits to, uh, to the medieval trade in indulgences? Can we, for instance, compare the Lutheran criticism of the indulgence letters to our contemporary climate calculations too? In 1517, the monk and priest Martin Luther wrote 95 theses that were burning indictments against the letters of indulgence. In these theses, he declared, among other things, that true repentance was not to be measured in the amount of money paid, but rather in the amount of true regret to be found in the depths of the sinner's soul. This regret in the depths of the soul is, a true, is the truth according to this philosophy. We might all recognize this idea in our own time, where it seems to be quite a normal claim that it is what is on the inside that counts. This inner truth is, however, invisible for anyone but ourselves. And when the real truth is such a personal and invisible truth on the bottom of each of our soul, it might be hard to act together towards a common goal. That problem is <clears throat> Oh, this sentence is a bit strange. That problem is the way in which the contemporary climate fire under our asses is sliding up because we cannot manage to get our asses together in collective action. Instead, it often seems that we mostly act to save each our own ass from blame and guilt. This area of Nora Jugostorden might be an example of such a problem because even if you get if you personally get to live a proper, pious and climate-positive life here, this life is so expensive that a large part of the world and community cannot afford it. That means, of course, that a large part of the community will keep living in their old and dirty ways. So if you look at the bigger picture, the actual impact of Nora Jürgen might, therefore, be quite small. In short, if climate action and penance is just a personal, individual matter, it might not actually matter at all. So, let us go to the bottom of these stairs and use this white banner as a giant cloth to metaphorically wash off the dirty results of the descent into the depths of each our own dirty soul. And <clears throat> while we do that, we might imagine that we are cleaning up the dirty habits of each of us acting alone. So please, let's take the banner and wash off the stairs carefully with the banner. Oops. So, let's find the good dirt and rub it in good. There's some good dirt to the sides there. We'll drag it a bit further. There's some dirt we haven't gotten here. I think here 
is really dirty. Come on down. <clears throat> so So the inability to act when we are divided, as I just talked about talked about before might also already have been recognized in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. Here we, could re we can read the story about the Tower of Babel and about how the high hopes of building a tower from which humanity could reach into the heavens and talk to God ended up dividing humanity. God is not amused by the idea of constant visits, I guess, and he punishes the builders by making everyone speak different languages. When they can't communicate anymore, it becomes impossible to continue the, the construction. The tower is never finished and humanity is forever divided. City planners and architects of the banlieues of Paris, the Million Programme of Sweden and many other similar constructions around the world might feel a strange kinship to those biblical builders. These places that were built in the 1960s and 70s, with high hopes and good intentions, has in some areas become their own contemporary Towers of Babel. By becoming social and economic enclaves for a limited range of incomes and social status statuses, these area, areas are in a way towers of, uh, towers of constructions that have also resulted in a sort of division of society. So let us now rub in the dirt under our rock too. Here on the scenic brink of Husaviken, overlooking the pretty scenery, pretty scenery of the park across the water. So please come and rub it in. So we go on a bit. Go this way. In the middle of this newly built area, we also find this playground here in the background, where a central element is a number of playhouses that imitate a traditional Swedish kind of building styles, style with fallow red wooden planks and other characteristics. While the rest of this area pr is proudly built in a variety of new materials and with modern clean technology, this li these li little houses seem to represent a strange longing for the old days where everything was actually much dirtier. <laughs> Maybe these playhouses that seem a bit out of place also reveal a glimpse of an ambiguous relationship that contemporary people have with modern lifestyles. When we make our children play in another environment than the one we are building, it might indicate that we are somewhat uneasy with the way we are in fact building and living. While the future is being constructed here in Nora Jürger Staden and similar places, we apparently don't want to expose our children to this future, even though they are, they are the ones that are going to live with it the longest. This kind of nostalgic fear of our modern life might also be the reason why the elites of Silicon Valley are renowned to limit their children's access to the tech that they create themselves. themselves. In 2010, Steve Jobs, for instance, told journalist Nick Bilton that his kids had never used the iPad. 
The tech elites of Silicon Valley are also famous for sending their children to the anti-tech Waldorf school of the, of the peninsula. In this school they do not use technology, but instead they knit and use pencils and paper and mud. The fact that this tech elite still sells its tech to other people's kids, even if they believe it to be such a sin, might be the biggest sin of all, of course. But maybe they do just do what they have to do, because the world of school tuition does not come cheap. In fact, tuition runs from $18,314 a year in nursery school to $42,000 a year for the senior years. But the mud here, in and around this playground, is still free. So let us roll in it and rub it in while we wonder about why we so often design worlds for our children that are nothing like the worlds we build for ourselves. So please, I think we have some good dirt right here. Free of charge. Let's try it on the grass too. Yeah. Just give it a rub there. I think we've done a good job here. If someone will grab the banner and uh, drag it along while we walk about 15 minutes to our next stop. Ah, I saw it on the other side. Even a priest must go to the toilet. And the need to relieve oneself can definitely also be a fire under your ass that gets you going as fast as any actual or hellish fire does. Any city planner, and especially one that plans an area like Nora Yuga Storden that is designed to reduce the dirt of our human lives, must of course also consider sewage and the infra infrastructure of shit as carefully as the actual buildings, the streets, or the public art. They already knew that in ancient Rome, where the sewer entry on the Forum Romanum was even honored with a small sanctuary for Venus Cloacina, the goddess of the sewer. Good sewage and sanitary toilet facilities might in fact have been an important factor in the development of our civilization. And it might have been what has made it possible to live as close together in cities as we do today. In spite of the fact, it, in spite of this fact, it doesn't seem that we pay so much attention to it in our daily lives though. Instead of celebrating those achievements, it seems that we would rather avoid the topic altogether. And we might only talk about it in euphemistic bashful terms like the restroom or the washroom. At the same time, stupid or unwanted talk might be referred to as toilet talk, talking shit, or snack in Swedish. In the latter years, however, the toilet has again become a matter of bigger public interest. And people throughout the world are starting to take shit seriously. The eternal longer line to the ladies' rooms have, for instance, become an area of serious political discussion. And on 19th of February, 2012, Chinese women in, women in Guangzhou called for, the, for potty parity policies, where women's toilets were to be proportionally larger to accommodate the longer queues. In 2011, a right to pee campaign also began in Mumbai, India, where women, but not men, had to pay to urinate. Activists collected more than 50,000 signatures supporting their demands that the local government stop charging women to urinate and build more toilets, keep them clean and hire female attendants. In response, city officials have agreed to build hundreds of public toilets for women in Mumbai. Toilets have also been an area of political interest here in Stockholm. The fact that the numbers of public toilets has dwindled here became a fire under the ass of politician Vivian Gunnarsson a Swedish MP from Die Gröna. In 2011 and 2016, she put forward a motion to Stockholm Lands Landsting to install more public toilets. She argued from her own experience as a commuter 
that the bus station of Slussen, for instance, was incredibly unpleasant and smelled of urine. She then elaborated that large groups of society were unable to travel freely. In an answer to the motion, the traffic department agreed that many public toilets had indeed been closed and explained that this had to be done due to disturbances such as vandalism and the way in which both travelers and non-travelers would use the toilets for their own personal hygiene. It isn't completely clear who these travelers and non-travelers that tend to their personal hygiene in a problematic way are, but I am making the assumption that it might be a euphemistic term, a euphemistic allusion to homeless people without a toilet of their own, which seems to make people feel somewhat unsafe. But not having access to such a toilet might instead result in an unavoidable necessity to actually pee in the corners, resulting in smelly uncleanliness that also feels unsafe and unsavory. And also extremely unsafe and unpleasant for those who do not have a toilet of their own. So, while a new area is being planned, which claims to be cleaning up our acts, the policies of public toilets may also be one to take note of. I don't know if there is a party policy in Nora Jürger Staden, but maybe the infrastructure structure of shit could be a devil in the detail that might, dis might disclose some of the more or less obvious desires, intentions and sins of a city plan. The fact that this toilet can only be paid for by a credit card might also be a sort of microaggression to take note of. A microaggression that target targets those that for different reasons do not have proper paperwork to get such a card. So, I will now give you all a moment alone with your pants down to think about that. Please take this chance, as I warn you that I haven't seen many public toilets on my Find a Toilet app in the direction we're headed. Before you go though, I will just read a small poem from the book Metamorphosis of Ajax, a discourse on a stale subject. That is a book that was written in 1596 by Sir John Harrington, the inventor of the flush toilet. In this book he laid out a detailed description of how to build a flush toilet at the same time as he used it to criticize, criticize prominent members of society by alluding to them as the excrement that is poisoning society. The poem I'll read is about a priest praying in a toilet and arguing with the devil about the propriety of talking to God in such a dirty place. The priest argues that his prayers will fly high to God while the shit will fall down to Satan. And the poem goes like this. A godly father sitting on a drought, to do as need and nature hath us taught, taught, mumbled certain prayers, and unto him the devil straight repairs, and boldly to revile him he begins, alleg that, alleging that such prayers are deadly sins, and that he showed he was devoid of grace to speak to God from such unmeet a place. The reverend man, though at first dismayed, Yet strong in faith to Satan, Satan thus he said, Thou damned spirit, wicked, false, and lying, Despairing thine own God and ours, envying, envying. Each take his due, and me thou canst not hurt, To God my prayer, I mean to thee the, the dirt. Pure prayer ascends to him that high doth sit, Down falls the filth, for fiance of hell more fit. So, while some might go to the bathroom or the toilet or wait in line, I hope the rest of us can finish this picture by rubbing in whatever kind of public dirt we might find in this area and by drying off the dirt on the, of the banner to reveal the picture properly. For that, I have some wet towels here that we can use. So, please feel free to use the toilet or soil the banner or wash off the banner. We'll just turn it around to the other side. So, see, it's working. So, now if we wash off the banner, the drawing should reveal itself. We should be able to wash off these places. 
and the dirt and the cloth should stick. Here you go. I'm so excited that it actually worked. <laughs> I'm really happy to see that we developed these sinners. And now I'll take you to the end of times, which is about 15 minutes away. Or at least I will take you to the end of the time I have with you. When we get there, I hope you'll all be part of a group picture with this crowd of naked sinners and the demons. These sinners, sinners and demons were originally painted on the ceiling of Södra Roda Kyrka, designed by the paint, or signed by the painter Mester Amund in 1494. The original was unfortunately lost in a tragic fire where the whole church burned to the ground in 2001. But tomorrow, this picture and these naked sinners will come to life again as a backdrop for a performance at the fire market at Strömbatären. Here I will be talking out of my ass in a quiz about stupidities in being caught with your pants down and walking straight into fire and other things. I hope to see you there too. Thank you. Just uh, stand over there. <laughs> or <laughs> does this look weird? <laughs>